Okay, praise God. You can still hear me, right? Yes, I hear you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, sometimes when I change screens and go from one thing to another, especially music, mm -hmm. it uh, does tricky things. And uh, so we'll just go on. And I, I think just thank God for the opportunity to uh, share with you this morning. I just want to have a word of prayer before we go for it. Uh, Lord, we just thank you again for uh, this gathering this morning of our Zoom church. And we just thank you and lift up every single person that's online, lift up their families, Lord God. And we just thank you, Father God, for just uh, letting the word of God empower them this morning. Let us all be changed to want to do even more for you, Lord God, each Amen. and every time that we read the word, each and every time that we hear the word, Lord God, let us always make forward movement in our growth, in our relationship with you, God. Uh, as we are in the last days, Lord God, uh, these are the times when we should accelerate our strength and our uh, desire, Father God, to want to know more about you, Lord God. And I just thank God for each and every person that joins uh, us on uh, our studies on Wednesday and Friday and on Sunday, Lord God, just be a blessing to them, Lord God, for the efforts that they make uh, as they put aside other things that they could be doing, Lord God, and, and gather around and be a part of our lesson. So just bless them immensely. Now open up all of our eyes and our ears and our hearts to receive this morning. And we'll be careful to give you all of the praise, the honor, and the glory that's due your name. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. 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 Well, this morning I'm going to be talking about should uh, we should choose to forgive. Uh, and that's a fact. We should choose to forgive. And that's a fact. So Lately, we've been dealing with a, uh, some pretty difficult issues, uh, and I expect it's going to continue for a while. Uh, we got to tackle these issues uh, that I call closet issues, uh, the non-feel-good type um, uh, things, uh, things that some people don't even want to deal with. And uh, so my subject today is forgiveness, forgiveness, amen? We're going to talk about forgiveness. So that said, that said, the church should be the leader uh, in setting standards um, in moral issues. How many agree with that? We should be the leaders. We should show people how it's done uh, according to the word of God. So we should set the standards in all moral issues for the unsaved world that we live in, that we live in. And forgiveness doesn't mean that it's forgetting. Some people say forgive and forget. Uh, not the way God made our brain. We can remember things that happened when we were two years old. So we can't pick and choose what we're going to remember and what we're not. So it's there. Uh, everything is there. But uh, so that doesn't mean when you forgive someone that you instantly forget. That means that it doesn't uh, bother you or it's not uh, an issue like it used to be once you forgive. Um, it, it, uh, it, it does mean, though, completely letting go, completely letting go so that you can live. There's freedom in forgiveness. There's freedom and forgiveness. The Bible says in John 8, 36, that if the son therefore shall make you free, what? You shall be free indeed. Whom the son sets free is free indeed. So rather, uh, forgiveness means letting go of the pain um, the incident is causing us. So we forgive and give ourselves peace of mind when we do that. And and in hopes that one day some, someone will return the favor if we offend them. So it uh, what goes around comes around. We know that the law of reciprocity. We know that. 
So a fact is unforgiveness is a sin that locks the unforgiving person in their own self-made prison. It locks a person in prison. A person who is walking around with unforgiveness, is, um, is, it, they might as well be as, in a physical prison. It's as, hard, it's as bad as being enslaved to mind-altering drugs or alcoholism. The same effects, the same effects. Unforgiveness is, uh, is a sin that will destroy its own container, meaning you eventually your body will begin to take a toll uh, because you are harboring unforgiveness and you refuse to let it go. You refuse to let it go. And the sin also, the sin of forgiveness puts a lot of people right on the path to hell, right on the path to hell. Because unforgiveness is what? It's a sin. So if there's anything that, um, someone has done to you or said, you know, whatever the situation is, um, just try to make it right. We're going to be talking about that and, and I'll give you some hints, clues, some things that'll help you to learn how to just release that as soon as possible. So you have to think if God can forgive you of your deepest, darkest sins, why can't you forgive others of small things, of small things? You repent and you ask God to forgive you, but you can't do the same to others. The, the things people don't want to forgive others for are things they have done themselves generally. It's like, well, he slandered me or he said something about me. I can't forgive him. Well, you have uh, uh, have you ever slandered anybody before? Have you ever said anything that was uh, incorrect about a person, slandered their name because you were mad or whatever the case might be? Whatever the case might be. So you got to get uh, you got to get rid of. Let me get find my screen here. I thought I had one. I'll just tell you, we have to get rid of the word can't. When we say we can't forgive, a lot of people say that they can't forgive. You got to get rid of that because it will send you on a path to hell. So unforgiveness is like taking poison, but expecting somebody else to die from it. It's also um, choosing to stay trapped in a jail cell of bitterness. It's like you're serving time for somebody else's crime. Amen. So uh, when it all boils down to the essence, unforgiveness is hatred. Unforgiveness is hatred. So we should, uh, I have a scripture here, Psalm 103. Uh, if you want to turn to it, if you have your Bibles, turn to Psalm 103, 10 and 12, 10 through 12. Psalm 103, verses 10 through 12. I'll give you a second to get it. You should always have your Bible ready when you're in Bible study at church, ready to turn at uh, the request of the teacher, because there's times when certain scriptures, we want you to see with your eyes directly. And sometimes I'll have them on the screen and sometimes I don't. So I want you to see this one. Okay, uh, Psalm 103, one through 12. I hope everybody has it. It says, he has not dealt with us according to our sins nor punished us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy towards, uh, towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. 
So God is always ready to forgive and mm -hmm. put our sins and uh, out into the sea of forgetfulness. And I tell everybody, you know, we sometimes are our own worst enemies when it comes to forgiveness, it, uh, receiving forgiveness from God. And we'll bring it up. Or we'll say, God, you know, remember when I did this and God is saying, what are you talking about? Once I forgave you, that was it. It's in the sea of forgetfulness. I don't even know what you're talking about. And that's how we should look at um, sins and things that people have done to us once we forgive them. We don't keep bringing it up as a uh, whole card, <laughs> so to speak. You know, when you see them or if they do something again, we go back in our sack of, uh, well, remember when you did this and remember when you did this and you remember when you said this? I know you guys don't do that, but I know you heard other people do that. Bring up the past. And that's to discredit people. That's to make them feel bad. That's to um, make them wallow around in the things that they did to you. You want them to feel it again. You want them to feel your hurt. So you keep bringing it up, bringing it up and bringing it up again. So that, that uh, uh, scripture in Psalm 103, that's our example. That's our example to forgive others. Forgiveness is a process. It's a process. It's not a singular action. For God, it is. Sometimes for us, we have to take baby steps, but we'll get there. And so it, it begs the question, what is the process? What is the process of forgive, uh, forgiving? There's several approaches to uh, understanding the process of forgiving and making sense of it. It's unique and um, your situation has to be called into question. So the way you handle it uh, depends on what the hurt is or what the situation is. But before I go further and before I give you the steps to forgive, uh, I want to address one of the biggest strongholds our adversary has established at the beginning of human history, and that is racism, okay? You didn't think you hear that this morning, did you? Racism. Racism has divided our country. It's divided people, period. And it all has to do, the healing comes from with forgiveness. And as Christians, how do we handle that? How do we do that? Okay, so well, let me just throw this out there. Maybe somebody can help, uh, help me answer this. Let me ask you a question. How many races, when we talk about racism, how many races do we have in the world? Anybody know that answer? How many races do we have in the world? One. One race, you sure? I'm positive. It's just the human race. Okay. Uh -huh. We all come from Adam and Eve. Amen. Okay. Everybody agree with Sharina? Amen. And, and yes. Pastor Sam. So yes, how in the world is there racism? Yes, how is there racism? If we all come from the same human family, Adam and Eve. So the de that's what de uh, the devil has used it as a tool. He's used it as a tool. Racism is a stronghold because it keeps us from walking together as we should. God intended for his people to walk and to labor together in his vineyard. Well, we can't do that for fighting each other. And it's called divide and conquer. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's actually a strategy. There's actually a strategy I want to show you. The um, uh, divide and conquer, or another word for it, is the divide and rule. Divide and rule. It's a tactic. Uh, uh, it's a tactic of divide and conquer. A divide and conquer strategy, also known as divide and rule strategy, is often applied in the arenas of politics and sociology. And this strategy, one power breaks another power into smaller, more manageable pieces. 
And then it takes control of those pieces one by one. It generally takes a very strong power to implement such a strategy, Satan. <laughs> In order to successfully break up another power or people or government, the conqueror must have access to strong political, military, economic machines in the natural. The strategy also includes methods uh, with which to control the funds and resources of the small conquered parties. So for example, a powerful leader may encourage a less powerful leader to make unwise financial decisions in order to drain the smaller powers resources. This is often successful in the leaders of smaller powers, uh, um, of the smaller powers have inflated uh, egos and delusions of grandeur. It is important to note that this form is only effective if, if the smaller power allows itself to be influenced by the larger power. A little bit more. Furthermore, in order to maintain power and influence, large governments will often work to keep smaller powers and governments from uniting. In fact, this, uh, this use of principles within the divide and conquer strategy is most com uh, common. It is much easier to prevent small powers from linking forces than to break them apart once, that, uh, once they have a line, once they have a line, okay? Oh, got a little bit more, sorry. Leaders who use a divide and conquer strategy may encourage or foster feuds between smaller powers. So this kind of political uh, maneuvering requires a great understanding of the people who are being manipulated. So in order to foster feuds, for example, one must understand the political and social histories of the parties intended to take part in the feuds, okay? Okay, so now this is in the natural, the, you know, what I just read, and it talks about governments and strategies and businesses and how to break them apart and how to take control. And, but that same strategy is used by the enemy. Satan uses the same strategy in the spiritual realm to bring division in homes, in business, but especially between people groups. Amen? Amen. And so hence racism. Racism. We've bought into, mankind has bought into the biggest lie ever perpetrated. Ever perpetrated. And the enemy has pitted people because of their color, because of where they live, because of economic statute, all kind of uh, entities uh, play a part and pit each other, um, pit us against each other. And we've fallen for it. So my, my reasoning for bringing this up is because We've got to get past this. We've got to get past this. Um, as Pastor Sam preaches to, to us all the time, it's one race, one blood. It's one race, one blood. Amen. Every last one of us has a, at least one drop of Adam and Eve's blood in us. Mm -hmm. Just think about that. You know, it goes all the way back to the garden. God didn't make another people group. Uh, they did spread over the, the world and they became accustomed to that section. And hence we got different uh, colors and we got different languages and we got, you know, it's, uh, we've done studies on this and we can do it again if, we, if, if, if some, some of you need to go through it. 
how the different colors, how the different groups, how everything came about. And when you put it together, it fits like a puzzle. Amen. But if we don't jump on it, it's unfortunately for the majority of the world to think differently. You know, it, it probably won't happen in our lifetime, but we can certainly start with our kids. We can start where we are. We can start uh, because kids naturally love one another, don't they? They naturally yeah. love one another. They play with each other. And, you know, they have to be told that they are different. They have to be told that, you know, don't play with Johnny over there because he's this or he's that. They have to be told that. So racism is a, is a learned um, strategy. You have to learn to be a racist and races is involved in every group, every group. Some groups like to go back to slavery. Every people group on the face of the earth has been slaves to somebody at some time. So we can't use that. So that's out. So uh, this is divide and conquer, and, and Satan has surely used it to his advantage and brought division among the people groups of the world. And, and so let me just, I should have gave you this first. What is racism? It's prejudice, discrimination, antagonism uh, directed against a person or a... We lost the sound. <laughs> yes, I, I guess. Okay, I guess, I guess so. so. Just getting good too. <laughs> right. No, it's a baiting. Right. Enemy, the enemy don't right. want this message Definitely. to go forth. Yeah. <laughs> I turned my volume up because it was getting so interesting. <laughs> For some reason, I thought if I leaned closer to my screen, I could hear it. <laughs> it didn't work, did it, Sister no, Linda? <laughs> it didn't. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Father God. In Jesus' name, praise you, Holy Father God. Written you a line in the name of Jesus. We bind you right now in Jesus' name. Hello, can you all hear me? Yes, I hear yes, you. Yes, 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 we can hear you now. Okay. Wow. How long has had I been off? <laughs> Um, a little over a minute, minute or so. Yeah, because mm -hmm. I was just talking. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, we were listening, and then it just stopped. Uh, <laughs> and I, I looked up at I looked up at my screen, and it was like spinning. I go, oh boy! <laughs> and I started saying hello, hello, and nobody was answering me. So I had to go. I had to go all the way up and join the meeting again. So oh, praise the Lord. Oh, wow. All the intercessors, please pray right now in the name of Jesus. Yeah, pray, pray silently in that. Yeah. Yeah, right. Please. Thank you. Okay. Uh, you heard me talk about the divide and conquer, and you saw that on the screen, right? Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to catch up to where I probably got cut off. Uh, did you hear me give a definition of racism? No, yes. yes. So what did I? I mean, you was going to talk about where it started. No, I I was going to give you a I was giving you a definition of racism. It simply means prejudice. Did you yeah, say you, that? You were yeah, doing. I didn't, I didn't hear that part. I guess mine was off before. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I heard it. Did anybody okay. else hear it? Because I did. I, okay. I heard that. I heard that, and then I think that's right around when I lost it. Okay, mm -hmm. so let me just yeah. start there. 
I'll start there. I was given a definition of racism. Simply put, it's prejudice, discrimination, antagonism um, uh, against different people groups. It's the belief that different races possess distinct characteristics, abilities, or qualities, especially so as to distinguish them as inferior or superior to one another. Mm -hmm. So different races are seen to have these qualities that put them at a disadvantage uh, themselves in manner. So you went out again. To, uh, wow. Hello? Hello. Can you hear me? It, no, it just popped up on my screen that our internet connection is, is unstable. unstable. I saw mm -hmm. that. Okay. Yeah, I heard where you were saying the racism about um, the prejudice of, of different groups and, and then it just kind of muffled real bad and mm -hmm. then I heard, hello? <laughs> Okay, we're gonna, get through, to... we're, we'll, we're gonna get through it some kind of way if I have to call you guys on the telephone individually. So anyway, <laughs> but uh, okay, the belief that different races possess distinctive characteristics, abilities or qualities, okay? Uh, especially so as to distinguish them. So these qualities, these characteristics distinguish distinguishes this particular group as inferior to another group or superior to another group. So we begin to look at this group as being superior to us or we are inferior to another group. So that's your mainstream over-the-counter definition, you know, of racism. You know, when people groups are pitted together, are pitted against one another because of where they live, their qualities, mainly in our society is the color of skin. Uh, it's, uh, it could be education. Um, it, it can be in, in some cultures, like in um, uh, in the Hindu Hindu culture, uh, they have what they call class. They have classes, and so um, even within their own, can you all hear me still? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you. Okay, no, I just, so it's even it's called a caste, C A S C E caste system, Hindu. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. So even within their mm -hmm. um, their society, uh, depending on your income, depending on your status, uh, your education. So if you are uh, like a, a professional, like a doctor, a teacher, a lawyer, in that type of uh, profession, well, you are in a different caste uh, system than the people uh, down the road who are, you know, trying to make it every day with crumbs and not able to eat and walking around hungry. But they basically don't talk to each other. You know, they don't deal with each other. And so they are not allowed to marry each other. So if the guy from the poor neighborhood meets a, meets a gal from the rich neighborhood, that wedding is not allowed, that marriage rather is not allowed to happen. And, and so that's, that's very sad. Um, it, and in most cultures, people don't call it a caste system, but it's some of the same entities. You know, people look at different groups different uh, than uh, if they're different than they are. And, and uh, there's racism in every group, every group. So every group. So um, until God's people embrace the fact that there is only one race and one blood, we'll have division. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Well, what can we do? 
what can we do? Let me see if I can give them a little screen. I had a couple more PowerPoints since I went to the trouble of making them. Oh, let's see. I might have lost that. Some kind of way. No, here it is. Okay, so what can we do? We can be the Christian. We can be the answer. And that's all it takes. That's all it takes. We can um, walk our life out according to the, the word of God and not be manipulated by the, um, the tactics and the strategies of the devil that tries to divide us. Mm -hmm. Or we can buy into the lie and walk the same way as the world and be racist ourselves, you know, against other people. Amen. So I hope I, I hope that, that was kind of clear. But Christians have to step up and they have to be the leaders in reconciliation. In reconciliation. Um, have peace talks, offering forgiveness, one-on-one -on -one discussions. That's the best thing. The more you know about somebody, the less chance there is to be racist towards them. Does that make sense? And sometimes it's just the fact that you just don't know this person. But once you get to know, that's why a lot of people, when they go to foreign countries and they become missionaries, which I have done, I've been to foreign countries and I've been a missionary. And once you meet people from other places, um, I mean, it's like, hey, there's no big deal. You know, they talk different. I, when I was in Haiti, they talk, they speak French, Creole couldn't understand a word they were saying. So I had an interpreter, but once I got to know that group of people, uh, it was like, you know, hanging out with people here in, in America. And so I think to uh, the best thing that we need, uh, we should do right now to start to get rid of that as much as we can is to be the Christian and be the answer. And like I said, talk to people, meet people, find out what they're about, find out a little bit about their culture, what they like to do, invite them over. You know, there's so many things that you can do to break that stronghold. And that's exactly what it is. And on news sources, and people who deliver the news and tell us what's going on in, in the world don't make it any better. They make it worse. They're feeding right into Satan's um, plan of keeping it going, keeping it going. There's money in that. There's money in that. That makes news. When you see people fighting against each other and, and uh, you know, racism and all of that kind of stuff. When you see that, that brings news, that brings money into the station. So I'm not gonna help them finance evil. Praise God. So those are some things we can do. So we, we, we must see Satan's schemes for what they are. And we also, like I said, we got to train up the next generation to be colorblind. To be colorblind. Children are not, like I said, children are not born with racism. They have to learn it. And they learn it from usually from the inside of their home. Hearing mom and dad and sister and brother talk about it. And then they hear a little bit more out in the street and hear a little bit more over here on this side. And by the time they get to be eight, nine, 10 years old, they're prime members of, you know, racism. But you can stop it in the bud in your house when, the, when something comes up 
uh, about somebody's race or who they are, or, you know, talking about them because they're this or that, you stop it right there. And you begin to teach them that it's one race and one blood. And wherever you got that from, son, daughter, take it back. We will not have that in our home. We have to do everything in our power to undo uh, racism and any kind of negativity. So I wanted to kind of throw that into the forgiveness. And, uh, you know, that should come into the picture too. If you get the opportunity to uh, talk to someone, and I could, we call them people groups, people groups more than races, because there's only one race. And it's kind of hard to even talk because we've just, it's embedded in us to say black, rot, white, brown, yellow people. And that's how we distinguish each other to let each other know who we're talking about. And so it's, it's kind of ingrained in us, but we can teach our children to be colorblind. It can start today. Amen. I want to give you, like I said, I want to give you a couple of, a few steps to um, understand how to deal with forgiveness, how to deal, how to you know, get rid of unforgiveness, how to deal with it in your life. And I'm, God never gives me a message that maybe half of the people who are listening does not need. Amen. So I'm going to say half the people that I'm talking to today have been dealing with uh, the issue of unforgiveness, unforgiveness, and it's sucking the life out of you and you got to get rid of it and you got to get rid of it today. Okay. So I'm going to give you some steps to get rid of it. First of all, you got to acknowledge that um, it exists, that you're holding unforgiveness uh, towards someone. You have to acknowledge the hurt that you're hurting. You gotta acknowledge who hurt you and why did they do it? What is the context of the situation and how long ago did it happen? For some people it goes all the way back, I mean like 20, 30, 40 years. They can't even remember the, the content of why they don't like somebody. They just know that they don't like, it's a whole family groups. This side don't like that side. Somebody said something and everybody chose sides who, whose side I'm gonna be on in the family. And so they come together at different functions like weddings and funerals, things like that. And it's the saddest thing you ever want to see. Because they're still walking around holding unforgiveness. So you got to acknowledge that it's there. And then you got to do something that I call consider. You got to consider. You got to consider how the hurt and pain has affected you. So the word consider is like a key to this whole thing because it involves thinking before making a decision. Before you decide on whether or not you're going to forgive this person, you got to consider the negative feelings you've acquired since the incident happened. How has the pain changed you? You know, some, some people have really, it's really taken a toll on their life. They've gone from being a good, happy person to just being um, a person that's kind of hard to deal with for, you know, or uh, a sad, fearful, all kind of emotions build up in a person who's holding on forgiveness. You got to consider how detrimental uh, it was that the, uh, this condition happened to you or this situation happened to you. The next step is you gotta accept, accept. You gotta accept that you cannot change the past. It's not going away, it happened, okay? 
no matter how much you wish this pain could be reversed, it's time to admit to yourself that 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 your anger towards that person won't it's not going to redeem what they have done to you it's it's during this step that you got to th uh, thoughtfully consider whether or not you want to forgive when you accept it you got to consider okay I got to make up my mind once and for all to forgive this person. Or you can continue to walk around in your jail and your soul will not be free. The next step is determine. You got to determine whether you will forgive. And so this is when the forgiveness process uh, will either begin or end right here okay Man. so this is i'm sorry oh, i thought someone said something uh so this decision should not be made lightly as it will determine the future of your relationship with that person then you gotta repair the next step is repair you got to repair the relationship with the person who did you wrong. And before any um, act of forgiveness or reconciliation can happen, rebuild the connection you used to have with that person. Make every effort to do that, to rebuild, begin to talk. You don't have to have an hour conversation. Just say, you know what? I haven't talked to you in a while. Just thought I'd call it, see how family was going how everything is going. You know, this is after the, those other steps, begin to have short conversations. So in most cases, uh, you'll be the instigator of this repairing. But if you, you know, thought about it enough, if you thoughtfully engaged in, in the other steps, then there's a high chance of success. Okay. Um, then the last step is learn. You got to learn what forgiveness means to you. Up until now, you probably thought that forgiveness is, is more for their benefit, right? But it's not, it's for yours. It's more for your benefit. It's more for your benefit. You were the one that took the blow. And that made you angry, fearful, mad, uh, you know, all of those things were going around and you've been walking around in this for years. And every time you hear that person's name or a situation where, you know, where, you know, you were involved or something, then it just brings back all of that anger and you just relive it all over again. all over again. But once the relationship is on, 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 on the uh, path to being restored and you've given yourself time to accept the reality of the past, then it's clear that forgiveness is a way for you to find closure, closure, closure. And that means something. That means something. The last step is forgive. Forgive. Forgive the person who wronged you. In some cases, this might be silent. You might not even know where the person is. You might have to just do it. It might be between you and God. Or you might take your prayer partner and let them sit in proxy and say, I got to get this off of my heart, my mind. It's taken a toll and I, I don't know where the person is. But would you represent that person? Would you sit in this chair or on the phone? Would you just listen to what I got to say? And, and you, you know, consider that person, that friend that you're, you're using 
for that um, to be the person that offended you. So you, you might be compelled to verbally forgive that person, even if you don't uh, expect a, a kind response. But if you have followed through on, the, on the, all of my steps, then their reaction won't really matter. What will matter is that you have found a way to let go and move on. Like I said, it's for you mostly. Folks holding unforgiveness become miserable, cunning, selfish, greedy, and blame it on the past or the people in their past saying, I am this way because of how that person mistreated me or what so-and-so did to me. So you begin to accept it and you begin to say, um, you should understand why, why I'm this way because if you had gone through what I went through, then you would da 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 da. In other words, you're saying, I have a right to be cunning, miserable, selfish, greedy, mad, you know, all of those things. But God wants us to know that the past has no power over us. Once we forgive, unless we choose to let it have power over us. And that we can let go of it because we have been renewed by his love and his redeeming grace. Unfortunately, some people feel that they, like I said, they have the right to do that. And this too is a lie from the pit of hell. You don't have a right to do, to be miserable, cunning, you know, all of those things because of what happened in the past. So rather than uh, changing negatively because of our unfair past and all of us have had things in our life that were unfair, different levels, different things. And if you think real hard, there's times that you've been unfair to people yourself. We should only show God's works in us by saying, I am nice, I'm smart, forgiving, sweet, and so forth, because of Christ's love and forgiveness in our life. And I want to end, I think I got it on my screen, with Galatians 2.20. It's on the screen up there. <clears throat> One of my favorite scriptures. Everybody knows that, I think. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Crucify the old flesh, that old evil flesh that even sometimes you don't like. And how do you expect somebody else to like you? And I guarantee you, when you begin to let go of all of that unforgiveness and do the repair work and reconciliation work that should take place, then you will be free, you'll feel better, your health will be better, your smile will be better, you'll be able to praise the Lord better, everything will be better because you're out of that cage, you're out of that prison that has kept you bound for so long, for so long. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I want to pray for anyone who might um, need to deal with forgiving someone, and it's uh, it's been an issue uh, with you uh, for a while. But today is the day of salvation. Today Amen. is the day of repair. Amen. So if if that's you, um, would you? Raise your hand, and I will pray as we close today.
stop recording. Okay, that's what I was trying to do. Okay. Hmm. I think you have to do it.